Chapter 9 The Affair at Salem Cemetery Jackson, Carroll, Station, December 1862, January 1863, Bolivar, February, May 1863. On the afternoon of December 18th, suddenly, without any previous warning or notification, the bugle sounded, Fall in, and all the regiment fit for duty, and not on guard at once formed on the regimental parade ground. From there, we marched to the depot, and with the 43rd Illinois of our brigade, got on the cars, and were soon being whirled over the road in a northerly direction. It was a warm, sunshiny day, and we common soldiers supposed we were going on just some little temporary scout. So we encumbered ourselves with nothing but our arms and haversacks and canteens. Neglecting to take our blankets was a grievous mistake, as later we found out to our sorrow. We arrived at Jackson a little before sundown, there left the cars, and, with the 43rd, forthwith marched out about two miles east of town. A little after dark we halted in an old field on the left of the road in front of a little old country graveyard called Salem Cemetery, and there bivouacked for the night. Along in the evening the weather turned intensely cold. It was a clear, star-lit night, and the stars glittered in the heavens like little icicles. We were strictly forbidden to build any fires, for the reason, as our officers truly said, the Confederates were not more than half a mile away, right in our front. As before stated, we had no blankets, and how we suffered with the cold. I shall never forget that night of December 18, 1862, we would form little columns of twenty or thirty men in two ranks, and would just trot round and round in the tall weeds and broom sedge to keep from chilling to death. Sometimes we would pile down on the ground in great bunches and curl up close together like hogs in our efforts to keep warm. But some part of our bodies would be exposed, which soon would be stinging with cold. Then up we would get and renew the trotting process. At one time in the night, some of the boys, rendered almost desperate by their suffering, started to build a fire with some fence rails. The red flames began to curl around the wood, and I started for the fire, intending to absorb some of that glowing heat, if, as Uncle Ramus says, it was the loss ock. But right then a mounted officer dashed up to the spot and sprang from his horse. He was wearing big cavalry boots and jumped on that fire with both feet and stamped it out in less time than I am taking to tell about it. I heard afterward that he was Colner Engelman of the 43rd Illinois, then the commander of our brigade. Having put out the fire, he turned on the men standing around and swore at them furiously. He said that the rebels were right out in our front and in less than five minutes after we had betrayed our presence by fires, they would open on us with artillery and shell hell out of us, and more to the same effect. The boys listened in silence, meek as lambs, and no more fires were started by us that night. But the hours seemed interminably long, and it looked like the night would never come to an end. At last, some little woods birds were heard, faintly chirping in the weeds and underbrush nearby. Then some owls set up a hooting in the woods behind us, and I knew that dawn was approaching. When it became light enough to distinguish one another, we saw that we presented a doleful appearance, all hollow-eyed, with blue noses, pinched faces, and shivering as if we would shake to pieces. Permission was then given to build small fires to cook our breakfast, and we didn't wait for the order to be repeated. I made a quart can full of strong hot coffee, toasted some bacon on a stick, and then, with some hardtack, had a good breakfast and felt better. Breakfast over, which didn't take long, the regiment was drawn back into the cemetery and placed in line behind the section of enclosing fence that faced to the front. The fence was of post and plank, the planks arranged lengthwise, with spaces between. We were ordered to lie flat on the ground and keep the barrels of our guns out of sight as much as possible. Our position in general may be described about as follows. 
the right of the regiment rested near the dirt road and at right angles to it. The ground before us was open for more than half a mile. It sloped down gently, then it rose gradually to a long bare ridge or slight elevation of ground which extended parallel to our front. The road was enclosed by an old-time staked and ridered fence of the worm pattern. On our right and on the other side of the road was a thick forest of tall trees in which the 43rd Illinois was posted. The cemetery was thickly studded with tall native trees and a few ornamental ones such as cedar and pine. Soon after we had been put in position, as above stated, Kohler Engelman, the brigade commander, came galloping up and stopped about opposite the front of the regiment. Major Orr, our regimental commander, who was in the rear of the regiment on foot, walked out to meet him. Engelmann was a German and a splendid officer. Good morning, Major, he said, in a loud voice we all heard. How are the poise? All right, answered the Major. We had rather a chilly night, but are feeling first rate now. Dad is good, responded the Colonel, and continued in his loud tone. Our friends are right out here in the bush. I reckon they'll show up presently. Maybe so they will give us a touch of dear artillery practice, but that hurts nobody. Shoost have the poise keep cool. Then he approached the Major closer, said something in a low tone we did not hear, waved his hand to us, and then galloped off to the right. He was hardly out of sight, when sure enough, two or three cannon shots were heard out in front, followed by a scattering fire of small arms. We had a small force of our cavalry in the woods beyond the ridge I have mentioned, and they soon appeared, slowly falling back. They were spread out in a wide, extended skirmish line, and acted fine. They would trot a little ways to the rear, then face about, and fire their carbines at the advancing foe, who, as yet, was unseen by us. Finally, they galloped off to the left and disappeared in the woods, and all was still for a short time. Suddenly, without a note of warning, and not preceded by even a skirmish line, there appeared coming over the ridge in front and down the road a long column of Confederate cavalry. They were, when first seen, at a walk and marching by the flank with a front of four men. How deep the column was we could not tell. The word was immediately passed down our line not to fire until at the word of command and that we were to fire by file, beginning on the right. That is, only two men, front and rear rank, would fire together, and so on, down the line. The object of this was apparent. By the time the left of the regiment had emptied their guns, the right would have reloaded, and thus a continuous firing would be maintained. With guns cocked and fingers on the triggers, we waited in tense anxiety for the word to fire. Major Orr was standing a few paces in the rear of the center of the regiment, watching the advance of the enemy. Finally, when they were in fair musket range, came the order, cool and deliberate, without a trace of excitement. At ten shun, battalion, fire by file, ready, commence firing, and down the line crackled the musketry. Concurrently with us, the old 43rd Illinois on the right joined in the serenade. In the front file of the Confederate column was one of the usual fellows with more daring than discretion who was mounted on a tall white horse. Of course, as long as that horse was on its feet, everybody shot at him or the rider. But that luckless steed soon went down in a cloud of dust, and that was the end of old Whitey. The effect of our fire on the enemy was marked and instantaneous. The head of their column crumpled up instanter, the road was full of dead and wounded horses, while several that were riderless went galloping down the road by us, with bridle reins and stirrups flapping on their necks and flanks. I think there is no doubt that the Confederates were taken completely by surprise. They stopped short when we opened on them wheeled around and went back much faster than they came, except a little bunch who had been dismounted. They hoisted a white rag, came in, and surrendered. 
the whole affair was exceedingly short and sweet. In duration, it could not have exceeded more than a few minutes, but it was highly interesting as long as it lasted. But now, the turn of the other fellows was to come. Soon after their charging column disappeared behind the ridge in our front, they put in position on the crest of the ridge two black, snaky-looking pieces of artillery and began giving us the benefit of the artillery practice Colonel Engelman had alluded to. They were beyond the range of our muskets. We had no artillery with our little force and just had to lie there and take it. I know nothing about the technicalities of cannon firing, so I can only describe in my own language how it appeared to us. The enemy now knew just where we were. There were no obstructions between them and us, and they concentrated their fire on our regiment. Sometimes they threw a solid shot at us, but mostly they fired shells. They were in plain sight, and we could see every movement connected with the firing of the guns. After a piece was fired, the first thing done was to swab it. Two men would rush to the muzzle with the swabber, give it a few quick turns in the bore, then throw down the swabber and grab up the rammer. Another man would then run forward with the projectile and insert it in the muzzle of the piece. The rammers would ram it home and then stand clear. The man at the breech would then pull the lanyard and now look out. A tongue of red flame would leap from the mouth of the cannon, followed by a billow of white smoke. Then would come the scream of the missile as it passed over our heads, if a solid shot, or exploded near our front or rear, if a shell. And lastly, we would hear the report of the gun. Then we all drew a long breath. When they threw shells at us, their method was to elevate the muzzle of the gun and discharge the missile in such a manner that it would describe what I suppose would be called the parabola of a curve. As it would be nearing the zenith of its flight, we could follow it distinctly with the naked eye. It looked like a big black bug. You may rest assured that we watched the downward course of this messenger of mischief with the keenest interest. Sometimes it looked as if it would hit our line, sure, but it never did. And, as stated, we could only lie there and watch all this, without the power on our part to do a thing in return. Such a situation is trying on the nerves. But firing at our line was much like shooting at the edge of a knife blade, and their practice on us, which lasted at least two hours for all practical results, to quote Call Engelman. Schust hurt nobody. A private of Queen G had his head carried away by a fragment of a shell, and a few others were slightly injured, and that was the extent of our casualties. After enduring this cannonading for the time above, stated, Kohler Engelman became apprehensive that the Confederate cavalry were flanking us and trying to get between us and Jackson, so he ordered our force to retire. We fell back in good order for about a mile, then halted and faced to the front again. Reinforcements soon came out from Jackson, and then the whole command advanced, but the enemy had disappeared. Our regiment marched in column by the flank up the road down which the Confederates had made their charge. They had removed their killed and wounded, but at the point reached by their head of column, the road was full of dead horses. Old Whitey was sprawled out in the middle of the lane, with his nostrils all wide and more than a dozen bullet holes in his body. Near his carcass, I saw a bloody yarn sock with a bullet hole square through the instep. I made up my mind then and there that if ever I happened to get into the cavalry, I would, if possible, avoid riding a white horse. I will now say something about poor Sam Cobb, heretofore mentioned, and then he will disappear from this history. Sam was with us at the beginning of this affair on December 19th, but the very instant that the enemy came in sight, he broke from the ranks and ran, and never showed up until we returned to Jackson some days later. He then had one of his hands tied up and claimed that he had been wounded in the fight. 
The nature of his wound was simply a neat little puncture, evidently made by a pointed instrument in the ball of the forefinger of one of his hands. Not a shot had been fired at us up to the time when he fled, so it was impossible for his hurt to have been inflicted by the enemy. It was the belief of all of us that he had put his forefinger against a tree and then jabbed the point of his bayonet through the ball thereof. I heard Captain Reddish in bitter language charge him with this afterwards, and poor Sam just hung his head and said nothing. When the regiment veteranized in 1864, Sam didn't re-enlist and was mustered out in February 1865 at the end of his term of service. On returning to his old home, he found that his reputation in the army had preceded him and it is likely that the surroundings were not agreeable. At any rate, he soon left there, emigrated to a southwestern state and died there several years ago. In my opinion, he really was to be sincerely pitied, for, I think, as he had told me at Bolivar, he just couldn't help it. We advanced this day, December 19th, only two or three miles beyond Salem Cemetery, and bivouacked for the night in an old field. The weather had changed and was now quite pleasant. Besides, the embargo on fires was lifted so the discomfort of the previous night was only something to be laughed about. The next day we were afoot early and marched east in the direction of Lexington, about 15 miles. But we encountered no enemy, and on December 21st turned square around and marched back to Jackson. Gender Forrest was in command of the Confederate cavalry operating in this region, and he completely fooled Jenner J.C. Sullivan, the Union commander of the District of Jackson. While we were on this wild goose chase towards Lexington, Forrest simply whirled around our flanks at Jackson and swept north on the railroad, scooping in almost everything to the Kentucky line and burning bridges and destroying culverts on the railroad in great shape. During our short stay that ensued at Jackson, an event occurred that I have always remembered with pleasure. In 1916, I wrote a brief preliminary statement touching this Salem Cemetery affair, followed by one of my army letters, the two making a connected article, and the same was published in the Erie, Kansas, record. It may result in some repetition, but I have concluded to here reproduce this published article, which I have called A Soldier's Christmas Dinner. A Soldier's Christmas Dinner by Judge Leander Stilwell. Christmas Day in the year 1862 was a gloomy one in every respect for the soldiers of the Union Army in West Tennessee. Five days before, the Confederate General Van Dorn had captured Grant's depot of supplies at Holly Springs and government stores of the value of a million and a half of dollars had gone up in smoke and flame. About the same time, Forrest had struck the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, on which we depended to bring us from. The North our supplies of hardtack and bacon, and had made a wreck of the road from about Jackson, Tennessee, nearly to Columbus, Kentucky. For some months previous to these disasters, the regiment to which I belonged, the 61st Illinois Infantry, had been stationed at Bolivar, Tennessee, engaged in guarding the railroad from that place to Toons Station, a few miles north of Bolivar. On December 18th, with another regiment of our brigade, we were sent by rail to Jackson to assist in repelling Forrest, who was threatening that place. On the following day, the two regiments, numbering in the aggregate about 500 men, in connection with a small detachment of our cavalry, had a lively and spirited little brush with the Confederate forces about two miles east of Jackson, near a country burying ground called Salem Cemetery, which resulted in our having the good fortune to give them a salutary check. Reinforcements were sent out from Jackson, and Forrest disappeared. The next day, our entire command marched about 15 miles eastwardly in the direction of the Tennessee River. It was doubtless supposed by our commanding general that the Confederates had retreated in that direction. 
but he was mistaken. Forrest had simply whipped around Jackson, struck the railroad a few miles north thereof, and then had continued north up the road, capturing and destroying as he went. On the succeeding day, December 21st, we all marched back to Jackson, and my regiment went into camp on a bleak, muddy hillside in the suburbs of the town, and there we remained until December 29th, when we were sent to Carroll Station, about eight miles north of Jackson. I well remember how gloomy I felt on the morning of that Christmas day at Jackson, Tennessee. I was then only a little over 19 years of age. I had been in the Army nearly a year, lacking just a few days, and every day of that time, except a furlough of two days granted at our camp of instruction before we left Illinois for the front, had been passed with the regiment in camp and field. Christmas morning, my thoughts naturally turned to the little old log cabin in the backwoods of western Illinois, and I couldn't help thinking about the nice Christmas dinner that I knew the folks at home would sit down to on that day. There would be a great chicken pot pie with its savory crust and a superabundance of light, puffy dumplings, delicious light, hot biscuits, a big ball of our own homemade butter, yellow as gold, broad slices of juicy ham, the product of hogs of our own fattening and home cured with hickory wood smoke, fresh eggs from the barn in reckless profusion, fried in the ham gravy, mealy Irish potatoes, baked in their jackets, coffee with cream about half an inch thick, apple butter and crab apple preserves, a big plate of wild honey in the comb, and winding up with a thick wedge of mince pie that mother knew so well how to make. Such mince pie, in fact, as was made only in those days, and is now as extinct as the dodo. And when I turned from these musings upon the bill of fare, they would have at home to contemplate the dreary realities of my own possible dinner for the day. My oyster can, full of coffee and a quarter ration of hardtack and sow belly, comprised the menu. If the eyes of some old soldier should light upon these lines, and he should thereupon feel disposed to curl his lip with unutterable scorn, and say, This fellow was a milksop, and ought to have been fed on Christian commission and sanitary goods, and put to sleep at night with a warm rock at his feet. I can only say, in extenuation, that the soldier, whose feelings I have been trying to describe, was only a boy, and boys, you probably know how it was yourselves during the first year of your army life, but, after all, the soldier had a Christmas dinner that day, and it is of that I have started out to speak. Several years ago, my old army letters, which had been so carefully kept and cherished for all these many years, passed from the keeping of those to whom they had been addressed back into the possession of him who penned them. And now, after the lapse of fifty-four years, one of these old letters, written to my father, shall retell the story of this Christmas dinner. Jackson, Tennessee, December 27, 1862 Mr. J. O. Stillwell, Otter Creek, Illinois. I wrote you a short and hasty letter the forepart of this week to let you know that I was all right and giving you a brief account of our late ups and downs, but I doubt if you have received it. The cars have not been running since we came back to Jackson from our march after Forrest. The talk in camp is that the Rebs have utterly destroyed the railroad north of here, clean to the Mississippi River and that they have also broken it in various places and damaged it badly south of here, between Bolivar and Grand Junction. I have no idea when this letter will reach you, but will write it anyhow, and trust to Luck and Uncle Sam to get it through in course of time. We are now in camp on a muddy hillside in the outskirts of Jackson. I think the spot where we are must have been a cavalry camp last summer. Lots of corn cobs are scattered on the ground, old scraps of harness leather, and such other truck as accumulates where horses are kept standing around. When we left Bolivar, we were in considerable of a hurry, with no time to primp or comb our hair, 
and neither did we bring our tents along, so we are just living out of doors now and boarding at Sprouls. There is plenty of wood, though, to make fires, and we have jayhawked enough planks and boards to lie on to, keep use out of the mood, so we just curl up at night in our blankets with all our clothes on and manage to get along fairly well. Our worst trouble now is the lack of grub. The destruction of the railroad has cut off our supplies, and there is no telling just exactly how long it may be before it will be fixed and in running order again. So they have been compelled, I suppose, to cut down our rations. We get half rations of coffee and quarter rations of hardtack and bacon what we call small rations, such as Yankee beans, rice, and split peas are played out. At least we don't get any. The hardtack is so precious now that the orderly sergeant no longer knocks a box open and lets every man help himself, but he stands right over the box and counts the number of tacks he gives to every man. I never thought I'd see the day when army hardtack would be in such demand that they'd have to be counted out to the soldiers as if they were money. But that's what's the matter now. And that ain't all. The boys will stand around until the box is emptied, and then they will pick up the fragments that have fallen to the ground in the divide and scrape off the mud with their knives and eat the little pieces and glad to get them. Now and then, to help out the sow belly, we get quarter rations of fresh beef from the carcass of a Tennessee steer that the quartermaster manages to lay hands on somehow. But it's awful poor beef, lean, slimy, skinny, and stringy. The boys say that one can throw a piece up against a tree, and it will just stick there and quiver and twitch for all the world like one of those blue-bellied lizards at home will do when you knock him off a fence rail with a stick. I just wish that old Forrest, who is the cause of about all this trouble, had to go without anything to eat until he was so weak that he would have to be fed with a spoon. Maybe after he had been hungry, real good for a while, he'd know how it feels himself and would let our railroads alone. But I want to tell you that I had a real bully Christmas dinner, in spite of Old Forest and the whole caboodle. It was just a piece of the greatest good luck I've had for many a day. When Christmas morning came, I was feeling awful blue. In spite of all I could do, I couldn't help but think about the good dinner you folks at home would have that day, and I pictured it all out in my imagination. Then about every one of the boys had something to say about what he would have for Christmas dinner if he was home, and they'd run over the list of good things till it was almost enough to make one go crazy. To make matters worse, just the day before in an old camp, I had found some tattered fragments of a New York illustrated newspaper with a whole lot of pictures about Thanksgiving Day in the Army of the Potomac. They were shown as sitting around piles of roast turkeys, pumpkin pies, pound cake, and goodness knows what else, and I took it for granted that they would have the same kind of fodder today. You see, the men in that army, by means of their railroads, are only a few hours from home, and Old Forest is not in their neighborhood. So it is an easy thing for them to have good times. And here we were, away down in Tennessee, in the mud and the cold, no tents, on quarter rations, and picking scraps of hardtack out of the mud and eating them. It was enough to make a preacher swear. But along about noon, John Ritchie came to me and proposed that inasmuch as it was Christmas Day, we should strike out and forage for a square meal. It didn't take much persuasion, and straightway we sallied forth. I wanted to hunt up the old colored woman who gave me the mess of boiled roasting ears when we were here last summer, but John said he thought he had a better thing than that. And as... He's ten years older than I am. I knocked under and let him take the lead. About half a mile from our camp, in the outskirts of the town, we came to a large, handsome, two-story and a half-frame house with a whole lot of nigger cabins in the rear. John took a survey of the premises and said, Lee, right here's our meat. 
we went into the yard at a little side gate between the big house and the nigger quarters and were steering for one of the cabins when out steps from the back porch of the big house the lady of the place herself. That spoiled the whole game. John whirled in his tracks and commenced to sidle away. But the lady walked towards us and said in a very kind and friendly manner, Do you men want anything? Oh, no, ma'am, replied John. We just came here to see if we could get some of the colored women to do some washing for us, but I guess we'll not bother about it today. Still backing away as he spoke. But the lady was not satisfied. Looking at us very sharply, she asked, Don't you men want something to eat? My heart gave a great thump at that, but to my inexpressible disgust, John, with his head thrown back and nose pointed skyward, answered, speaking very fast, Oh, no, ma'am, not at all, ma'am, a thousand times obliged, ma'am, and continued his sneaking retreat. By this time, I had hold of the cape of his overcoat and was plucking it in utter desperation. John, I said, speaking low, what in thunder do you mean? This is the best chance we'll ever have. I was looking at the lady, meanwhile, in the most imploring manner, and she was regarding me with a kind of a pleasant, amused smile on her face. She saw, I guess, a mighty, dirty-looking boy, whose nose and face were pinched and blue with hunger, cold, loss of sleep, and hard knocks generally, and she brought the business to a head at once. You men come right in, she said, as if she was the major general commanding the department. We have just finished our dinner, but in a few minutes the servants can have something prepared for you, and I think you are hungry. John, with the most aggravating mock modesty that I ever saw in my life, began saying, We are very much obliged, ma'am, but we haven't the slightest occasion in the world to eat, ma'am. And when I couldn't stand it any longer for fear he would ruin everything after all, I said, Madam, Please don't pay any attention to what my partner says, for we are most desperately hungry. The lady laughed right out at that and said, I thought so. Come in. She led the way into the basement story of the house where the dining room was. All the rich people in the South have their dining rooms in the basement, and there was a nice warm room, a dining table in the center, with the cloth and dishes yet on it and a big fireplace at one end of the room where a crackling wood fire was burning. I tell you, it was different from our muddy camp on the bleak hillside where the wind blows the smoke from our fires of green logs in every direction about every minute of the day. I sat down by the fire to warm my hands and feet, which were cold. A colored girl came in and commenced to arrange the table, passing back and forth from the dining room to the kitchen. And in a short time, the lady told us that our dinner was ready, to sit up to the table and eat heartily. We didn't wait for a second invitation that time. And oh, what a dinner we had. There was a great pile of juicy fried beefsteak, cooked to perfection and tender as chicken, nice warm light bread a big cake of butter, stewed dried apples, cucumber pickles, two or three kinds of preserves, coffee with sugar and cream, and some of the best molasses I ever tasted. None of this sour, scorched old sorghum stuff, but regular gilt-edge first-class New Orleans golden syrup, almost as sweet as honey. Then, to top off with, there was a nice stewed dried apple pie, and some kind of a custard in little dishes, something different from anything in that line that I had ever seen before, but mighty good. And then, in addition to all that, we were seated on chairs at a table with a white cloth on it, and eating out of china plates and with knives and forks, a colored girl waiting on us, and the lady of the house sitting there and talking to us as pleasantly as if we were Grant and Halleck in person. Under the influence of the good grub, John thawed out considerably and made a full confession to the lady about his queer actions at the beginning. He told her that we were going to the nigger quarters to try to get something to eat, 
and that when she came out and gave us such a kind invitation to come in the house, he was too much ashamed of our appearance to accept that we had come up from Bolivar about a week before, riding on top of the boxcars, where we got all covered with smoke, dust, and cinders, then ordered out to the front that night, then the fight with Forrest the next day, then the march towards the Tennessee River and back of about 40 miles, and since then in camp with no shelter, tramping around in the mud and sleeping on the ground. That on account of all these things, we looked so rough and so dirty that he just felt ashamed to go into a nice house where handsome, well-dressed ladies were. Oh, I tell you, old John is no slouch. He patched up matters remarkably well. The lady listened attentively, said she knew we were hungry the moment she saw us, that she had heard the soldiers were on short rations in consequence of the destruction of the railroad, and turning towards me, she went on to say, there was such a pitiful hungry look on this boy's face that it would have haunted me for a long time if I had let you go away without giving you a dinner. Many a hungry soldier, she continued, both of the northern and southern army has had something to eat at this table, and I expect many more will in the future before this terrible and distressing war shall have come to an end. She didn't say a word, though, by which we could tell whether her sympathies were on the Union side or against us, and, of course, we didn't try to find out. She was just the sweetest-looking woman I have yet seen in the whole Southern Confederacy. If they have any angels anywhere that look kinder or sweeter or purer than she did, I would just like to see them trotted out. I guess she was about thirty-five years old. She was of medium height, a little on the plump order, with blue eyes, brown hair, a clear, ruddy complexion, and the whitest, softest-looking little hands I ever saw in my life. When we had finished our dinner, John and I thanked her ever so many times for her kindness, and then bade her a most respectful goodbye. He and I both agreed on our way back to camp to say nothing about the lady and the nice dinner she gave us, because if we blowed about it, the result would probably be more hungry callers than her generosity could well afford. But these close times, I guess, are not going to last much longer. The talk in camp this evening is that we are going to have full rations once more in a day or two, that the railroad will soon be in running order again, and then we can just snap our fingers at Old Forest and his whole outfit. Well, I will bring my letter to a close. Don't worry if you fail to get a letter from me now as regularly as before. Things are a trifle unsettled down here yet, and we may not be able to count on the usual regularity of the mails for some time to come. So, goodbye for this time. Soon after we returned to Jackson, a detail of some from each company was sent to Bolivar and brought up our knapsacks and blankets, and we were then more comfortable. On December 29th, my company and two others of our regiment were sent by rail to Carroll Station, about eight miles north of Jackson. There had been a detachment of about a hundred men of the 106th Illinois Infantry previously stationed here, guarding the railroad, but Forrest captured them about December 20th. So, on our arrival, we found nothing but a crude sort of stockade and the usual rubbish of an old camp. There was no town there. It consisted only of a platform and a switch. Our life here was somewhat uneventful, and I recall now only two incidents which, possibly, are worth noticing. It has heretofore been mentioned how I happened to learn when on picket at night something about the nocturnal habits of different animals and birds. I had a somewhat comical experience in this respect while on guard one night near Carroll Station, but it should be preceded by a brief explanation. It was no part of the duty of a non-commissioned officer to stand a regular tour of guard duty with his musket in his hands. It was his province simply to exercise a general supervisory control over the men at his post, and especially to see that they relieved each other at the proper time. 
but it frequently happened in our regiment that our numbers present for duty were so diminished and the guard details were so heavy that the sergeants and corporals had to stand as sentries just the same as the privates, and this was especially so at Carroll Station. On the occasion of the incident about to be mentioned, the picket post was on the crest of a low ridge, or slight elevation, and under some big oak trees by an old tumble-down deserted building, which had at one time been a blacksmith shop. There were three of us on this post, and one of my turns came at midnight. I was standing by one of the trees, listening, looking, and meditating. The night was calm with a full moon. The space in our front, sloping down to a little hollow, was bare, but the ascending ground beyond was covered with a dense growth of young oaks which had not yet shed their leaves. We had orders to be extremely watchful and vigilant, as parties of the enemy were supposed to be in our vicinity. Suddenly I heard in front, and seemingly in the farther edge of the oak forest, a rustling sound that soon increased in volume. Whatever was making the noise was coming my way, through the trees, and down the slope of the opposite ridge. The noise grew louder and louder, until it sounded just like the steady tramp, over the leaves and dead twigs, of a line of marching men, with a front a hundred yards in width. I just knew there must be trouble ahead, and that the Philistines were upon me, but a sentinel who made a false alarm while on duty was liable to severe punishment, and at any rate would be laughed at all over the regiment and never hear the last of it. So I didn't wake up my comrades, but got in the shadow of the trunk of a tree, cocked my gun, and awaited developments, and soon they came. The advancing line emerged from the forest into the moonlight, and it was nothing but a big drove of hogs out on a midnight foraging expedition for acorns and the like. Well, I let down the hammer of my gun and felt relieved, and was mighty glad I hadn't waked the other boys. But I still insist that this crackling, crashing uproar made by the advance of the hog battalion through the underbrush and woods under the circumstances mentioned, would have deceived the very elect. A few days later, I was again on picket at the old blacksmith shop. Our orders were that at least once during the day, one of the guards should make a scout out in front for at least half a mile, carefully observing all existing conditions for the purpose of ascertaining if any parties of the enemy were hovering around in our vicinity. On this day, after dinner, I started out alone on this little reconnoitering expedition. I had gone something more than half a mile from the post and was walking along a dirt road with a cornfield on the left and big woods on the right. About a hundred yards in front, the road turned square to the left with a cornfield on each side. The corn had been gathered from the stalk and the stalks were still standing. Glancing to the left, I happened to notice a white cloth fluttering above the corn stalks at the end of a pole and slowly moving my way. And peering through the tops of the stalks, I saw coming down the road behind the white flag about a dozen Confederate cavalry. I broke into a run and soon reached the turn in the road, cocked my gun, leveled it at the party, and shouted, Halt! They stopped, mighty quick and the bearer of the flag called to me that they were a flag of truce party. I then said, Advance, one. Whereupon they all started forward. I again shouted, Halt! and repeated the command, Advance, one. The leader then rode up alone, I keeping my gun cocked and at a ready, and he proceeded to tell me a sort of rambling, disjointed story about there being a flag of truce party on business, connected with an exchange of some wounded prisoners. I told the fellow that I would conduct him and his squad to my picket post, and then send word to our commanding officer, and he would take such action as he thought fit and proper. On reaching the post, I sent in one of the guards to the station to report to Lou. Armstrong, in command of our detachment, that there was a flag of truce party at my post who desired an interview with the officer in command at Carroll Station. 
The lieutenant soon arrived with an armed party of our men, and he and the Confederate leader drew apart and talked a while. This bunch of Confederates were all young men, armed with double-barreled shotguns and a decidedly tough-looking outfit. They finally left my post, escorted by loot, Armstrong and his guard, and I understood in a general way that he passed them on to someone higher in authority at some other point in our vicinity, possibly at Jackson. They may have been acting in good faith, but from the manner of their leader and the story he told me, I have always believed that their use of a flag of truce was principally a device to obtain some military intelligence. But, of course, I do not know. My responsibility ended when Lute Armstrong reached my picket post in response to the message sent him. We remained at Carroll Station until January 27, 1863, were then relieved by a detachment of the 62nd Illinois Infantry, and were sent by rail back to Bolivar, where we rejoined the balance of the regiment. We then resumed our former duty of guarding the railroad north to Toon Station and continued at this until the last of May, 1863. But before taking up what happened then, it will be in order to speak of some of the changes that in the meantime had occurred among the commissioned officers of my company and of the regiment. Captain Reddish resigned April 3, 1863. First Lieutenant Daniel S. Keeley was promoted captain in his place, and Thomas J. Warren, the sergeant major of the regiment, was commissioned as first lieutenant in Keeley's stead. Lute Cole Fry resigned May 14, 1863. His place was taken by Major Simon P. Orr and Daniel Grass, captain of Co. H. was made major. The resignations of both Fry and Reddish as I always have understood, were because of ill health. They were good and brave men, and their hearts were in the cause, but they simply were too old to endure the fatigue and hardships of a soldier's life. But they each lived to a good old age. Cole Fry died in Greene County, Illinois, January 27, 1881, aged nearly 82 years, and Captain Reddish passed away in Dallas County, Texas, December 30th, 1881, having attained the psalmist limit of threescore and ten. Chapter 10. The Siege of Vicksburg, June and July, 1863. General Grant closed up against Vicksburg on May 19th, and on that day assaulted the Confederate defenses of the place, but without success. On the 22nd, a more extensive assault was made, but it also failed, and it was then evident to Grant that Vicksburg would have to be taken by a siege. To do this, he would need strong reinforcements, and they were forthwith sent him from various quarters. So it came to pass that we went also. On May 31st, we climbed on the cars, headed for Memphis, and steamed away from Old Bolivar, and I have never seen the place since. For my part, I was glad to leave. We had been outside of the main track of the war for several months, guarding an old railroad, while the bulk of the Western Army had been actively engaged in the stirring and brilliant campaign against Vicksburg, and we were all becoming more or less restless and dissatisfied. From my standpoint, one of the most mortifying things that can happen to a soldier in time of war is for his regiment to be left somewhere as a guard while his comrades of the main army are in the field of active operations, seeing and doing big things that will live in history. But, as before remarked, the common soldier can only obey orders, and while some form the moving column, others necessarily have stationary duties. But at last, the old 61st Illinois was on the wing, and the Mississippi Central Railroad could go hang. The regiment at this time was part of General Nathan Kimball's division of the 16th Corps, and the entire division left Tennessee to reinforce Grant at Vicksburg. We arrived at Memphis in the afternoon of the same day we left Bolivar, the distance between the two places being only about 72 miles. 
The regiment bivouacked that night on a sandbar on the waterfront of Memphis, which said bar extended from the water's edge back to a high, steep sand and clay bank. And that, by the way, is the only night I have ever spent within the limits of the city of Memphis. While we were there on this occasion, I witnessed a pathetic incident, which is yet as fresh and vivid in my memory as if it had happened only yesterday. Soon after our arrival, I procured a pass for a few hours and took a stroll through the city. While thus engaged, I met two hospital attendants carrying on a stretcher, a wounded Union soldier. They halted as I approached and rested the stretcher on the sidewalk. An old man was with them, apparently about sixty years old, of small stature and slight frame, and wearing the garb of a civilian. I stopped and had a brief conversation with one of the stretcher-bearers. He told me that the soldier had been wounded in one of the recent assaults by the Union troops on the defenses of Vicksburg and, with others of our wounded, had just arrived at Memphis on a hospital boat, that the old gentleman present was the father of the wounded boy, and having learned at his home in some northern state of his son being wounded, had started to Vicksburg to care for him, that the boat on which he was journeying had rounded in at the Memphis Wharf next to the above-mentioned hospital boat, and that he happened to see his son in the act of being carried ashore, and thereupon at once went to him and was going with him to a hospital in the city. But the boy was dying, and that was the cause of the halt made by the stretcher-bearers. The soldier was quite young, seemingly not more than eighteen years old. He had an orange, which his father had given him, tightly gripped in his right hand, which was lying across his breast. But, poor boy, it was manifest that that orange would never be tasted by him, as the glaze of death was then gathering on his eyes, and he was in a semi-unconscious condition, and the poor old father was fluttering around the stretcher, in an aimless, distracted manner, wanting to do something to help his boy. But the time had come when nothing could be done. While thus occupied, I heard him say in a low, broken voice, He is the only boy I have. This was on one of the principal streets of the city, and the sidewalks were thronged with people, soldiers, and civilians, rushing to and fro on their various errands and what was happening at this stretcher excited no attention beyond careless, passing glances. A common soldier was dying. That was all, nothing but a leaf in the storm. But for some reason or other, the incident impressed me most sadly and painfully. I didn't wait for the end, but hurried away, tried to forget the scene, but couldn't. On the evening of June 1st, we filed on board the big side-wheel steamer, Luminary, which soon cast off from the wharf, and in company with other transports crowded with soldiers, went steaming down the Mississippi. Co. D., as usual, was assigned to a place on the hurricane deck of the boat. After we had stacked arms and hung our belts on the muzzles of the guns, I hunted up a corner on the forward part of the deck, sat down, looked at the river and the scenery along the banks, and thought. There came vividly to my mind the recollection of the time, about fourteen months previous, when we started out from St. Louis, down the Father of Waters, bound for the seat of war. The old regiment, in every respect, had greatly changed since that time. Then we were loud, confident, and boastful. Now we had become altogether more quiet and grave in our demeanor. We had gradually realized that it was not a Sunday school picnic excursion we were engaged in, but a desperate and bloody war, and what the individual fate of each of us might be before it was over, no one could tell. There is nothing which, in my opinion, will so soon make a man out of a boy as actual service in time of war. Our faces had insensibly taken on a stern and determined look, and soldiers who, a little over a year ago, were mere laughing, foolish boys, were now sober, steady, self-relying men. 
We had been taking lessons in what was, in many important respects, the best school in the world. Our voyage down the river was uneventful. We arrived at the mouth of the Yazoo River on the evening of June 3rd. There, our fleet turned square to the left and proceeded up that stream. Near the mouth of the Chickasaw Bayou, the fleet landed on the left bank of the stream. The boats tied up for the night. We went on the shore and bivouacked there that night. It was quite a relief to get on solid ground and where we could stretch our legs and stroll around a little. Alligator bend, and if we would be on the lookout, we would see some alligators. None of us, so far as I know, had ever seen any of those creatures, and, of course, we were all agog to have a view of them. A few of the best shots obtained permission from the officers to try their muskets on the reptiles, in case any showed up. On reaching the bend indicated, there were the alligators, sure enough, lazily swimming about and splashing in the water. They were sluggish, ugly-looking things, and apparently from six to eight feet long. Our marksmen opened fire at once. I had read in books at home that the skin of an alligator was so hard and tough that it was impervious to an ordinary rifle bullet. That may have been true as regards the round balls of the old small-bore rifle, but it was not the case with the conical bullets of our hard-hitting muskets. The boys would aim at a point just behind the foreshoulder. The ball would strike the mark with a loud whack. A jet of blood would spurt high in the air. The alligator would give a convulsive flounce and disappear. It had doubtless got its medicine. But this alligator practice didn't last long. Jenner and Kimball, on learning the cause, sent word mighty quick from the headquarters boat to stop that firing, and we stopped. About noon on the 4th, we arrived at the little town of Satarcha on the left bank of the Yazoo and about 40 miles above its mouth. There, the fleet halted, tied up, and the troops debarked and marched out to the highlands back of the town. We were now in a region that was new to us, and we soon saw several novel and strange things. There was a remarkable natural growth called Spanish moss that was very plentiful and a most fantastic-looking thing. It grew on nearly all the trees, was of a grayish-white color with long, pendulous stems. The lightest puff of air would set it in motion, and on a starlight night, or when the moon was on the wane and there was a slight breeze, it presented a most ghostly and uncanny appearance, and the woods were full of an unusual sort of squirrels, being just as black as crows. They were in size, as I now remember, of a great intermediate the fox and gray squirrels we had at home. But all their actions and habits appeared to be just the same as those of their northern cousins. And there was a most singular bird of the night that was quite numerous here, called the Chuck Will's Widow, on account of the resemblance its note bore to those words. It belonged to the Whip or Will family, but was some larger. It would sound its monotonous call in the night for hours at a stretch, and I think its mournful cry, heard when alone, on picket at night out in dense, gloomy woods, is just the most lonesome, depressing strain I ever heard. On the afternoon of the 4th, all our force advanced in the direction of the little town of Mechanicsburg, which lay a few miles back of the river. Those in the front encountered Confederate cavalry, and a lively little skirmish ensued, in which our regiment was not engaged. Our troops burnt Mechanicsburg and captured about 40 of the Confederates. I was standing by the side of the road when these prisoners were being taken to the rear. They were all young chaps, fine, hardy-looking fellows, and were the best-looking little bunch of Confederates I saw during the war. Early in the morning of June 6th, we fell into line and marched southwest in the direction of Vicksburg. Our route, in the main, was down the valley of the Yazoo River. And it will be said here that this was the hottest, most exhausting march I was on during my entire service. In the first place, the weather was intensely hot. 
Then, the road down the valley on which we marched mostly ran through immense fields of corn, higher than our heads. The fields next the road were not fenced, and the corn grew close to the beaten track. Not the faintest breeze was stirring, and the hot, stifling dust enveloped us like a blanket. Every now and then we would pass a soldier lying by the side of the road, overcome by the heat and unconscious, while one or two of his comrades would be standing by him, bathing his face and chest with water, and trying to revive him. I put green hickory leaves in my cap and kept them well saturated with water from my canteen. The leaves would retain the moisture and keep my head cool, and when they became stale and withered, would be thrown away and fresh ones procured. Several men died on this march from sunstroke. None, however, from our regiment, but we all suffered fearfully, and pure drinking water was very scarce too. It was pitiful to see the men struggling for water at the farmhouse wells we occasionally passed. In their frenzied desperation, they would spill much more than they saved, and ere long would have the well drawn dry. But one redeeming feature about this march was we were not hurried. There were frequent halts to give the men time to breathe, and on such occasions, if we were fortunate enough to find a pool of stagnant swamp water, we would wash the dirt and dust from our faces and out of our eyes. As we trudged down the Yazoo Valley, we continued to see things that were new and strange. We passed by fields of growing rice, and I saw many fig trees, loaded with fruit, but which was yet green. And in the yards of most of the farmhouses was a profusion of domestic flowers, such as did not bloom in the north, of wonderful color and beauty. But, on the other hand, on the afternoon of the second day's march, I happened to notice by the side of the road an enormous rattlesnakey, which evidently had been killed by some soldier only a short time before we passed. It seemingly was between five and six feet long, and the middle of its body appeared to be as thick as a man's thigh. Its rattles had been removed, presumably as a trophy. It was certainly a giant among rattlesnakes, and doubtless was an old-timer. On the evening of June 7th, about sundown, we arrived at Haines Bluff on the Yazoo River, and there went into camp. This point was about 12 miles north of Vicksburg, and had been strongly fortified by the Confederates, but Grant's movements had compelled them to abandon their works without a battle. There had been a large number of Confederates camped there, and the ground was littered with the trash and rubbish that accumulates in quarters and our friends in gray had left some things in these old camps which are long we all fervently wished they had taken with them, namely, a most plentiful quantity of the insect known as pediculus vestimenti, which forthwith assailed us as voraciously as if they had been on quarter rations or less ever since the beginning of the war. On June 16th, we left Haines Bluff and marched about two miles down the Yazoo River to Snyder's Bluff, where we went into camp. Our duties here, as they had been at Haines, were standing picket and constructing fortifications. We had the usual dress parade at sunset, but the drills were abandoned. We had more important work to do. General Joe Johnston, the Confederate commander outside of Vicksburg, was at Jackson, Mississippi, or in that immediate vicinity, and was collecting a force to move on Grant's rear in order to compel him to raise the siege. Grant thought that if Johnston attacked, it would be from the northeast, so he established a line of defense extending southeast from Haines Bluff on the north to Black River on the south, and placed General Sherman in command of this line. As Grant has said somewhere in his memoirs, the country in this part of Mississippi stands on edge. That is to say, it consists largely of a succession of high ridges with sharp, narrow summits. Along this line of defense, the general course of these ridges was such that they were admirably adapted for defensive purposes. 
we went to work on the ridges with spades and mattocks and constructed the strongest field fortifications that I ever saw during the war. We dug away the crests, throwing the dirt to the front, and made long lines of breastworks along our entire front, facing, of course, the northeast. Then, at various places, on commanding points, were erected strong redoubts for artillery, floored, and revetted on the inner walls with thick and strong green lumber and timbers. On the exterior slopes of the ridges were dug three lines of trenches, or rifle pits, extending in a parallel form from near the base of the ridges, almost to the summit, with intervals between the lines. All the trees and bushes in our front, on the slopes of the ridges, were cut down, with their tops outwards, thus forming a tangled abatis, which looked as if a rabbit could hardly get through. And finally, on the inner slope of the ridges, a little below their summits, was constructed a covered way. That is, a road dug along the sides of the ridges, and over which an army, with batteries of artillery, could have marched with perfect safety. The purpose of these covered ways was to have a safe and sheltered road right along our rear, by which any position on the line could be promptly reinforced if necessary. Sometimes I would walk along the parapet of our works, looking off to the northeast where the Confederates were supposed to be, and I ardently wished that they would attack us. Our defenses were so strong that, in my opinion, it would have been a physical impossibility for flesh and blood to have carried them. Had Johnston tried, he simply would have sacrificed thousands of his men without accomplishing anything to his own advantage. It will be said here that I have no recollection of having personally taken part in the construction of the fortifications above mentioned. In fact, I never did an hour's work in the trenches, with spade and mattock, during all my time. I never took willingly to that kind of soldiering. But there were plenty of the boys who preferred it to standing picket, because, when on fatigue duty, as it was called, they would quit about sundown, and then get an unbroken night's sleep. So, when it fell to my lot to be detailed for fatigue, I would swap with someone who had been assigned to picket, he would do my duty, and I would perform his. We were both satisfied, and the fair inference is that no harm was thereby done to the cause, and it was intensely interesting to me, when on picket at night on the crest of some high ridge, to stand and listen to the roar of our cannon pounding at Vicksburg, and watch the flight of the shells from Grant's siege guns and from the heavy guns of our gunboats on the Mississippi. The shells they threw seemed principally to be of the fuse variety, and the burning fuse, as the shell flew through the air, left a stream of bright red light behind it like a rocket. I would lean on my gun and contemplate the spectacle with far more complacency and satisfaction than was felt when anxiously watching the practice on us by the other fellows at Salem Cemetery about six months before. There was another thing I was wont to observe with peculiar attention when on picket at night during the siege, namely, the operations of the Signal Corps. In the nighttime, they used lighted lanterns in the transmission of intelligence, and they had a code by which the signals could be read with practically the same accuracy as if they had been printed words. The movements of the lights looked curious and strange, something elf-like, with a suspicion of witchcraft or deviltry of some kind, about them. They would make all sorts of gyrations, up, down, a circle, a half circle to the right, then one to the left, and so on. Sometimes they would be unusually active. Haynes Bluff would talk to Snyder's, Snyder's to Sherman's headquarters, Sherman's to Grant's, and back and forth, all along the line. Occasionally, at some station, the lights would act almost like some nervous man talking at his highest speed in a perfect splutter of excitement, and then they would seem as if drunk or crazy. Of course, I knew nothing of the code of interpretation, and so understood nothing, could only look and speculate. In modern warfare, 
the telephone has probably superseded the signal service, but the latter certainly played an important part in our civil war. During the siege, we lived high on some comestibles not included in the regular army rations. Corn was in the roasting ear state, and there were plenty of big fields of it beyond and near the picket lines, and we helped ourselves liberally. Our favorite method of cooking the corn was to roast it in the shuck. We would snap the ears from the stalk, leaving the shuck intact, daub over the outside a thin plaster of mud, or sometimes just saturate the ears in water, then cover them with hot ashes and live coals. By the time the fire had consumed the shuck down to the last or inner layer, the corn was done, and it made most delicious eating. We had no butter to spread on it, but it was good enough without, and then the blackberries. I have never seen them so numerous and so large as they were there on those ridges in the rear of Vicksburg. I like them best raw, taken right from the vine, but sometimes, for a change, would stew them in my coffee can, adding a little sugar, and prepared in this manner, they were fine, but, like the darkies rabbit, they were good anyway. The only serious drawback that we had on our part of the line was the unusual amount of fatal sickness that prevailed among the men. The principal types of disease were camp diarrhea and malarial fevers, resulting, in all probability, largely from the impure water we drank. At first, we procured water from shallow and improvised wells that we dug in the hollows and ravines. Wild cane grew luxuriantly in this locality, attaining a height of 15 or 20 feet, and all other wild vegetation was rank in proportion. The annual growth of all this plant life had been dying and rotting on the ground for ages, and the water would filter through this decomposing mass and become well-nigh poisonous. An order was soon issued that we should get all water for drinking and cooking purposes from the Yazoo River and boil it before using. But it was impossible to compel complete obedience to such an order. When men got thirsty, they would drink whatever was handy, orders to the contrary notwithstanding. And the water of the river was about as bad as the swamp water. I have read somewhere that Yazoo is an Indian word, signifying the river of death, and if so, it surely was correctly named. It is just my opinion, as a common soldier, that the epidemic of camp diarrhea could have been substantially prevented if all the men had eaten freely of blackberries. I didn't have a touch of that disorder during all the time we were in that locality and I attribute my immunity to the fact that I ate a liberally of blackberries about every day. But Camp Diarrhea is something that gets in its work quick, and after the men got down with it, they possibly had no chance to get the berries. And all the time we were at Snyder, nearly every hour of the day, could be heard the doleful, mournful notes of the Dead March played by the military bands, as some poor fellow was being taken to his long home. It seemed to me at the time, and seems so yet, that they should have left out that piece of music. It did no good, and its effect was very depressing, especially on the sick. Under such circumstances, it would seem that common sense, if exercised, would have dictated the keeping dumb of such saddening funeral strains. Sometime during the latter part of June, the regiment was paid two months' pay by Major C. L. Bernay, a paymaster of the U.S. Army. He was a fine old German, of remarkably kind and benevolent appearance, and looked more like a venerable Catholic priest than a military man. After he had paid off the regiment, his escort loaded his money chest and his personal stuff into an ambulance, and he was soon ready to go to some other regiment. Several of our officers had assembled to bid him goodbye, and I happened to be passing along and witnessed what transpired. The few farewell remarks of the old Iman were punctuated by the roar of the big guns of our army and navy pounding away at Vicksburg, and the incident impressed me as somewhat pathetic. 
Goodbye, Colonel, said Major Bernay, extending his hand. Boom. Goodbye, Major. Boom. Goodbye, Captain. Boom. And so on to the others. Then, with a wave of his hand to all the little group, Goodbye, gentlemen's all. Boom. Maybe so. Boom. We meet not again. Boom. 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 It was quite apparent that he was thinking of the so-called fortunes of war. Then he sprang into his ambulance and drove away. His prediction proved true. We never met again. The morning of the 4th of July opened serene and peaceful, more so, in fact, than in old times at home, for with us not even the popping of a firecracker was heard. And the stillness south of us continued as the day wore on. The big guns of the Army and Navy remained absolutely quiet. Our first thought was that because the day was a national holiday, Grant had ordered a cessation of the firing in order to give his soldiers a day of needed rest. It was not until some time in the afternoon that a rumor began to circulate among the common soldiers that Vicksburg had surrendered, and about sundown we learned that such was the fact. So far as I saw or heard, we indulged in no whooping or yelling over the event. We had been confident all the time that the thing would finally happen, so we were not taken by surprise. There was a feeling of satisfaction and relief that the end had come, but we took it coolly and as a matter of course. On the same day that Vicksburg surrendered, Grant started the greater part of his army under the command of General Sherman in the direction of Jackson for the purpose of attacking General Johnston. Our division, however, remained at Snyder's until July 12th when we left there, marching southeast. I remember this march especially from the fact that the greater part of it was made during the night. This was done in order to avoid the excessive heat that prevailed in the daytime. As we plodded along after sunset, at root step and arms at will, a low hum of conversation could be heard, and occasionally a loud laugh that spoke the vacant mind. By ten o'clock we were tired. We had been on the road since noon, and moreover getting very sleepy. Profound silence now prevailed in the ranks, broken only by the rattle of canteens against the shanks of the bayonets and the heavy, monotonous tramp of the men. As Walter Scott has said somewhere in one of his poetical works, no cymbal clashed, no clarion rang. Still were the pipe and drum, save heavy tread and armor's clang, the sullen march was dumb. The column halted about midnight, we bivouacked in the woods by the side of the road, and I was asleep about as soon as I struck the ground. We resumed the march early in the morning, and during the forenoon arrived at Messenger's Ford on Black River, where we went into camp. We remained here only until July 17th, and on that day marched a few miles south to the railroad crossing on Black River and bivouacked on the west bank of the stream. The Confederates, during the campaign, had thrown up breastworks of cotton bales, which evidently had extended for quite a distance above and below the railroad crossing. When our fellows came along, they tore open the bales and used the cotton to sleep on, and when we arrived at the place, the fleecy stuff was scattered over the ground, in some places half-knee-deep, all over that portion of the river bottom. It looked like a big snowfall. Cotton, at that very time, was worth one dollar a pound in the New York market, and scarce at that. A big fortune was there in the dirt, going to waste, but we were not in the cotton business just then, so it made no difference to us. At the beginning of the war, it was confidently asserted by the advocates of the secession movement that cotton was king, that the civilized world couldn't do without it, and as the South had a virtual monopoly of the stuff, the need of it would compel the European nations to recognize the independence of the Southern Confederacy, and which would thereby result in the speedy and complete triumph of the Confederate cause. But in thus reasoning, they ignored a law of human nature. Men 
under the pressure of necessity, can get along without many things which they have previously regarded as indispensable. At this day, in my opinion, many of the alleged wants of mankind are purely artificial, and we would be better off if they were cut out altogether. Aside from various matters of food and drink and absurdities in garb and ornaments, numbers of our rich women in eastern cities regard life as a failure unless they each possess a thousand-dollar pet dog. Decorated with ribbons and diamond ornaments and honored at dog functions with a seat at the table, where, on such occasions, pictures of the dogs with their female owners sitting by them are taken and reproduced in quarter-page cuts in the Sunday editions of the daily papers. If these women would knock the dogs in the head and bring into the world legitimate babies, or even illegitimate, for their husbands are probably of the capon breed, then they might be of some use to the human race. As it is, they are a worthless, unnatural burlesque on the species. But this has nothing to do with the war or the 61st Illinois, so I will pass on. While we were at the Black River Railroad Bridge, thousands of paroled Confederate soldiers captured at Vicksburg passed us, walking on the railroad track, going eastward. We had strict orders to abstain from making to them any insulting or taunting remarks, and so far as I saw, these orders were faithfully obeyed. The Confederates looked hard. They were ragged, sallow, emaciated, and seemed depressed and disconsolate. They went by us with downcast looks and in silence. I heard only one of them make any remark whatever, and he was a little drummer boy, apparently not more than fifteen years old. He tried to say something funny, but it was a dismal failure. While in camp at the railroad crossing on Black River, a most agreeable incident occurred, the pleasure of which has not been lessened by the flight of time, but rather augmented. But to comprehend it fully, some preliminary explanation might be advisable. Before the war, there lived a few miles from our home, near the Jersey Landing Settlement, a quaint and most interesting character, by the name of Benjamin F. Slayton. He owned and lived on a farm, but had been admitted to the bar and practiced law to some extent, as a sort of a sideline. But I think that, until after the war, his practice, in the main, was confined to the courts of justices of the peace. He was a shrewd, sensible old man, of a remarkably kind and genial disposition, but just about the homeliest-looking individual I ever saw, and he had a most singular, squeaky sort of a voice, with a kind of a nasal twang to it, which, if heard once, could never be forgotten. He was an old friend of my father's, and had been his legal adviser so far as his few and trifling necessities in that line required, from time immemorial, and for a year or so prior to the outbreak of the war, my thoughts had been running much on the science of law, and I had a strong desire, if the thing could be accomplished, to sometime be a lawyer myself. So, during the period aforesaid, whenever I would meet Uncle Ben, as we frequently called him, I would have a lot of questions to fire at him about some law points, which it always seemed to give him much pleasure to answer. I remember yet one statement he made to me that later, and sometimes to my great chagrin, I found out was undeniably true. Leander, said he, if ever you get into the practice of law, you'll find that it is just plumb full of little intric eight pints. But things are not as bad now in that respect as they were then. The war ensued, and in September 1862, he entered the service as Captain of Kyoichu, K of the 97th Illinois Infantry. He was about 42 years old at this time, in due course of events, the regiment was sent south and became a part of the Army of the Tennessee, but the paths of the 61st and the 97th were on different lines, and I never met Cap Tutur. Slayton, in the field, until the happening of the incident, now to be mentioned, 
When we were at Black River, I was on picket one night about a mile or so from camp at a point on an old country road. Sometime shortly after midnight, while I was curled up asleep in a corner of the old worm fence by the side of the road, I was suddenly awakened by an energetic shake, accompanied by the loud calling of my name. I sprang to my feet at once, thinking maybe some trouble was afoot, and, to my surprise, saw Captain Keeley standing in front of me with some other gentleman. Still well, said Keeley. Here's an old friend of yours. He wanted to see you, and being pressed for time, his only chance for a little visit was to come to you on the picket line. My caller stood still and said nothing. I saw that he was an officer, for his shoulder straps were plainly visible, but I could not be sure of his rank, for there was no moon, and the night was dark. He was wearing an old sugar loaf hat, seemingly much decayed. His blouse was covered with dust, and in general, he looked tough. His face was covered with a thick, scraggy beard, and under all these circumstances, it was impossible for me to recognize him. I was very anxious to do so, in view of the trouble the officer had taken to come away out on the picket line, in the middle of the night, to see me, but I just couldn't, and began to stammer a sort of apology about the darkness of the night, hindering a prompt recognition, when the unknown gave his head a slant to one side, and, in his never forgettable voice, spoke thus to Keeley. I told you he wouldn't know me. I know you now, said I. I'd recognize that voice if I heard it in Richmond. This is Capt. Ben Slayton of the 97th Illinois. And springing forward, I seized his right hand with both of mine while he threw his left arm about my neck and fairly hugged me. It soon came out in the conversation that ensued that his regiment had been with Sherman in the recent move. From the time of his arrival until his departure, there was no sleeping by anybody on that picket post. We sat on the ground in a little circle around him and listened to his comical and side-splitting stories of army life and incidents in camp and field generally. He was an inimitable storyteller, and his peculiar tone and manner added immensely to the comicality of his anecdotes. And somehow he had the happy faculty of extracting something humorous or absurd from what the generality of men would have regarded as a very serious affair. He did the most of the talking that night, while the rest of us sat there and fairly screamed with laughter. It was well known and understood that there were no armed Confederates in our vicinity, so we ran no risk in being a little careless. Finally, when the owls began tuning up for day, the old captain bade us goodbye and trudged away, accompanied by Cap Keeley. To fully comprehend this little episode, it is, perhaps, necessary to have some understanding and appreciation of how a soldier, away down south, far from home, and the friends he had left behind, enjoyed meeting some dear old friend of the loved neighborhood of home. It was almost equal to having a short furlough. I never again met Captain Slotten during the war. He came out of it alive, with an excellent record, and about 37 years after the close died at his old home in Jersey County, Illinois, sincerely regretted and mourned by a large circle of acquaintances and friends.